Suzanne Morphew vanished on Mother's Day in 2020. Investigators have long believed her to be dead. They were so confident, in fact, that in 2021, they charged her husband Barry Morphew with murder without ever locating her body. Now, the charges against Barry Morphew were dropped mere weeks before he was set to begin trial, and he's currently suing prosecutors and investigators for $15 million for essentially ruining his life by accusing him of being a killer. However, on September 22nd, this entire case flipped completely upside down when Suzanne's remains were accidentally uncovered in a shallow grave while investigators in an unrelated case were searching a remote area of Colorado. So after three years, we now know that the mother of two is dead, but the Colorado Bureau of Investigations has refused to confirm whether or not they're investigating that death as a homicide. Now, Suzanne's manner of death hasn't been revealed, but a forensics expert told me that all signs are pointing to homicide because he says law enforcement has tipped their hand in a big way. Well, I think that probably the most significant thing is probably the fact that this was the word that they're using. Two words, actually, um, and that's shallow grave. Graves don't dig themselves. That was Joseph Scott Morgan. He's a professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University and the host of the Body Bags podcast. Now, in his professional opinion, the use of the term shallow grave all but confirms Suzanne's manner of death is murder. And I get it, that term, shallow grave, it provides a powerful visual, but Morgan says it also suggests an action. It is so very specific, Caitlin. I cannot tell you because, you know, for, for me as a forensics guy, when I first heard about it, first off, I was shocked <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't see this coming. It came out of left field for me. And I've been covering this case for a couple of years now uh, from the moment she disappeared. The discovery of Suzanne's body came to a shock for a lot of us who covered this case over the years. And it changed a lot for the DA who originally tried to prosecute this without a body. No body, no cause of death, no physical evidence is a, it, it, it can be surmounted, but it's very difficult for the state to create a compelling story that a jury is willing to convict on. If you followed this at all, you'll remember that Suzanne's husband, Barry, was charged with her murder, even though, like I said, we didn't have her body. In the days since her remains were found, though, social media has been alight with people wondering if he would be charged a second time. His lawyer released a lengthy written statement to KKTV condemning the renewed finger pointing from the public. It read in part, law enforcement focuses in on a person and refuses to review evidence objectively and fairly. It is a disservice to the community and creates exactly what has come to light, years of unsolved murders. From the get-go, Barry Morphew has maintained his innocence and he's been supported by he and Suzanne's two adult daughters. But now that Suzanne's body has been found, the big question is, will prosecutors charge him for the murder again? Defense attorney Josh Shipper tells me that things are going to be far more difficult the second time around, though. If the state's going to be under more than the usual scrutiny. Um, there's always a certain level of scrutiny when the state's going to bring charges. It's going to be amplified here because we've got what's happened previously. We've got all this reasonable information that everybody is aware of, including the courts. So the state understands with the second bite at the apple, it's always going to be a little bit of a different dynamic. The other side knows what you're going to do, and you've really got to have everything set up, locked down. There can't be hiccups. Suzanne's body was discovered by accident while cops were searching for a missing woman in an unrelated case. Now, they stumbled upon human remains in a remote area of Colorado, some 40 plus miles away where she first went missing. DailyMail.com exclusively reported that the area is known as the Boneyard, and it's called that because multiple bodies have been recovered there. Sources have told Joseph Scott Morgan that Suzanne's body was not intact and that her remains were scattered allegedly in a 75 mile radius. Now, to be clear, law enforcement has not confirmed this, but. Think about an old fashioned wagon wheel and you've got that central hub of the old-fashioned wagon wheel, that's our shallow grave. And then all of the spokes that radiate out from that hub, that's the disbursement of remains. How her remains looked haven't been revealed, but Morgan said that there is unlikely to be any soft tissue left due to the time elapsed and the elements in the wilderness. So we're probably talking about bones here, but bones can do a lot of talking. If the body was dismembered, how it was cut can often be determined from markings on the bones themselves, and then those markings can be potentially matched to a weapon. And as I mentioned earlier, that term shallow grave tells us a lot beyond the fact that, like Joseph said, it didn't dig itself. The shape, the depth, even down to how skilled the digger was can help determine who did the digging. You find forensically, well, 
in in this environment if someone is taking a tool like a shovel or perhaps a pickaxe and they're breaking ground but if you can find a stone that's been struck by the leading edge of the shovel if you have that shovel in your possession and you can tie it back to that area where it was struck that's significant. We don't know precisely when Suzanne died, only when she disappeared. Her last known communication was on May night, the day before she was reported missing. According to prosecutors, the communication was a message containing a bikini selfie that she sent around 2 p.m. to her lover, Bob Thicken. Suzanne and Barry Morphew didn't have a great relationship, and court records show that she told her husband the week preceding her disappearance that their 25-year marriage was over. The messy marriage was really laid out in painful detail through text messages, recordings, and notes all taken by Suzanne that were laid out in more than 100 pages of court documents. Shortly before she vanished, Suzanne had accused Barry of a long history of infidelity, which he denied. Meanwhile, Suzanne was telling her lover in messages that she wanted to be his wife. So the theory the state was working off of at the time was that Barry had found out about the affair and snapped. The selfie to Suzanne's lover, Jeff Libler, was sent at 2.07 p.m. from the Morphe's home on the 9th. Cell phone records show that Barry's phone was moving around outside of the house from 2.42 to 2.44 p.m., which investigators believe was a crucial time period. It's a lot of sense for law enforcement to continue with their narrative that there was an encounter on this day that he was moving around the house, as reflected in the triangulation, um, and that could have been an angry conversation, a polite conversation, or it could have been her chasing her around with a gun. The bit about the weapon is particularly interesting because Barry later told law enforcement that he was at the house shooting chipmunks and prosecutors revealed in a preliminary hearing that a bullet was recovered near Suzanne's side of the bed. If, hypothetically, a firearm was used to kill Suzanne, evidence of which, Joseph Scott Morgan says, could be found among her remains, all of those bits can now be kind of strung together to make for a really powerful case, but nothing is that simple. When Barry was the prime suspect in his wife's disappearance, investigators extensively searched their home, his car, their daughter's cars, looking for blood. They even used police dogs, and they didn't find a single trace. Now, at the time, he also went public with this desperate plea to find his missing wife. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you, we miss you, your girls need you. No questions asked. However much they want, I will do whatever it takes to get you back. It's funny, I love you. I want you back. The state's initial case was based on a lot of circumstantial evidence, like an empty tranquilizer dart found in the Morpheus dryer, along with a pair of khaki shorts. Shorts that Barry appeared to be wearing in security footage on the last day that Suzanne was seen alive. Barry also wasn't the one to first flag Suzanne's disappearance. A neighbor had raised the alarm about Suzanne on May 10th after the Morphew girls, Mallory and Macy's, contacted her because they were concerned they couldn't get a hold of their mom to wish her a happy Mother's Day. Barry told cops that Suzanne had just gone for a bike ride and never returned. One point, he suggested she might have been taken by a mountain lion, but Suzanne's bike was recovered pretty close to the house shortly after her disappearance and her helmet was somewhere else. Investigators always felt like the bike situation was a little fishy because, according to police, Suzanne didn't take her camel back, which she always did on a ride, so they just suspected she never actually went on that bike ride. Now, in court, prosecutors also presented some behavior of Barry's that weekend. His phone was going in and out of airplane mode, and data from the truck showed that he was just opening and closing doors repeatedly in the early hours of the tent. But the relevance of all of this previous evidence might change now that we have a body and a crime scene where the body was disposed. But we've got this missing mom from all these years ago. And that moment, Caitlin, is frozen in time. So yeah, if you look back in time and you look at everything that was initially gathered, all of a sudden, they might have a bit here that begins to put this into a tighter focus. And suddenly things that seemed disjointed and disconnected back then, you know, might, you know, might have some kind of anchor now. Now, we don't have the full picture yet, but in Josh Shiver's professional opinion, he feels like Barry got a raw deal and that law enforcement appeared to shoehorn evidence to fit the common narrative that the husband did it. Here's an example of where Josh says he saw that in action. Prosecutors previously had raised the point that at one time, Barry had reeked of chlorine after leaving a motel around when Suzanne disappeared, now indicating to them that he had used strong cleaning products, perhaps to clean blood. That there were some statements where the officer was and it smelled like bleach, and there was bleach, and that means that they're hiding bodies, bleaching out blood. Nah, it could just be that that room's above the pool. And that 
that's kind of what it turned it out. So great job, officer jumps to conclusions. What other conclusions did you make before you knew enough? For a long time, investigators believed Suzanne's body was dumped near the Garfield mine, primarily because Barry had admitted to being in the area when she disappeared. Garfield mine is here, and Suzanne's remains were actually found here, a fact that Morphe's attorney has pointed out. Law enforcement was never looking for Suzanne in the Moffat area or area south of Maysville because they only focused in on Barry being the suspect. And they knew Barry was not south of Maysville and certainly not 45 miles south. Now he goes on to say that authorities already have an accounting of Barry's locations on the 9th and the 10th, and it wasn't near the area where Suzanne was found. Again, we're seeing how the discovery of Suzanne's body could really upend the prosecution's original theory of the case. But with all that said, there is a real possibility that Barry Morphine could still be charged again for Suzanne's murder. His initial charges were dismissed with what's called without prejudice, which means he can be charged again if new evidence emerges. Something like double jeopardy, which we've all heard of, doesn't come into play here because he didn't go to trial. Complicating matters, though, is his civil lawsuit, which was filed near months before Suzanne's body was found. Now, that civil case also adds substantial dimension to the defense of the criminal case because what's the best way to stop the civil lawsuit, which is going to be known about by everybody, it, you're going to, as the defense, use that to show why the state has motivations to betray their oath, why the state has motivations to not do the job the best way possible. As Barry Morphew's lawsuit and Suzanne Morphew's death investigation progresses, you will have a lot of updates, so check DailyMail.com.